Good evening, and welcome to this month's virtual Amherst Arts Night Plus. I'm Elizabeth Bradley, co-chair of Amherst Monthly Art Walk. Even as Amherst reopens, many of our vibrant arts venues remain closed or are inaccessible to those in our community who are high risk. We recognize art as an essential part of Amherst, especially during this pandemic when it's so important to not lose touch with what uplifts our spirits and inspires us. So for the past few months, Amherst Arts Night Plus has offered virtual presentations so that you may enjoy local artists and performers while you shelter in place. Thank you for attending this virtual event and know that we look forward to seeing you again in our galleries and museums in person as soon as it is safe to do so. I hope you enjoy the program. My shop by day teaches young people the medium of metalworking uh, using the medium of the plasma cutter, the angle grinder, and the MIG welder to kind of teach a little bit of math, science, and history to young people that might be having a hard time. In my other spare time, I do a lot of commercial and residential work for places like the High Horse in Amherst, Mass, or 
the plan, which is a hair salon going in over my shop. I'll do a mixture of woodworking and metalworking to create desks and tables and shelving and things of that sort. I found by doing bars and restaurants and hair salons and things of that sort, it served, yes, an artistic, but very functional nature. My first summer at Hampshire, I ended up procuring an apprenticeship with a guy named Charles Winkler down in Fells Point, Baltimore. He taught me a lot of his secrets. I'm sure that he had more. But the art of using the weld to join two pieces together and then blend it to create one continuous piece. To create sculptures that seem to be one solid piece when they could be made out of hundreds of pieces at that. After my time with him, I came back and I just really I had the bug, you know. So I'd call him and ask questions. It sort of set me on a path of destruction in the world of metal. There was also another guy named Julius Joel Ford who just helped me get on the right path. And so I think without him, I wouldn't necessarily have given it as hard of a shot in, in community college to then turn around and end up getting a scholarship at Hampshire College. There was another guy named Wesley Montgomery who I worked at Project 2050 with, and it was the same sort of deal, you know, having an older male that was just there for advice, was there as somebody to go to if needed. I think you get lucky to have mentors like that in your life. As I've now come into a position of mentorship, I feel it's part of my obligation as a teacher to give what I can back to young people that come through my space. The first thing I made was a meat flipper. <laughs> it's, it's this sort of a strange hook that you kind of hook under a large piece of meat and can flip it over, but you had to forge it. It, it got me so interested that I led to my first commission that I didn't even weld together because at that point I didn't know how to weld. But I hand hammered like 200 le leaves for this podium and you know welded them all on. It was very ornate and intricate or what I thought ornate and intricate was at the time. And that sort of showed me that I could make money doing this. But it really happened with Charles Winkler and you know, after I was with him for a little bit, we ended up making this large praying mantis. That sort of work is what really opened up the floodgates to say, you are creating sculpture. You are putting multiple pieces together and building something that I then realized is virtually immortal in a lot of ways. Ronan, that's a very important story. So that's a piece I'd never get rid of. That's based on my mentor, Julius Ford. He passed suddenly, and the day I found out, I didn't really know how to deal, so I went into the shop and just started working. And the whole time I thought I was making him, you know, homage to my mentor, but then when I finished it, you know, he had this song called Ronin that he wrote, and it was about, it was a parallel of the Japanese samurai who lost his teacher to young black men in America today who grow up without fathers. And just how that is an interesting, a, a perfect parallel because you are great, you can learn many things, but to not have that father figure really is a, a harsh setback in a lot of ways. Um, many people make it without fathers. I pulled it off all right. But as I was finishing the piece, I realized with that song, I was making a self-portrait. You know, the legs are too heavy to let me take flight, but he taught me to turn my nothingness, the nothingness of me, into something. So that as these, once again, these many parts become one solid 
beautiful form on the top taught you to grow wings, but you've got to still work on them. The arms wrapping around in opposite direction, or in the same direction, I guess, represent, the, I, I call it the self-love hug. It represents the double helix, which, you know, in turn could be infinite. So giving that much care to yourself and having learned that through somebody, I think is important. A lot of people are doing stuff that simplify the purpose of functionality and I see it as an opportunity to use my sculptural background and create more of an artistic flair behind it with the steel. But then the wood is naturally beautiful. It does what it does on its own. You know, metal you have to cut and get angles and turn into something. A square tube isn't as appealing as a tube that's juxtaposed in many different ways and welded together and, you know, but still functions as a leg. Whereas the wood comes with its wood grain. If you burn it, it stands out a little more. Just the sheer weight of it, you know, really speaks to what it once was. So the conference table coming from 200 year old beams that then were virtually cryogenically saved in these mill buildings to then get the old paint off of them and bring it back to life, it's already telling a story there on its own. But to then keep the weight of that story, I like to make the wood a little thicker because it served this purpose of holding up a building well, I want you to see its history in its functionality now. So that's Southern Reclamation Wood. After, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation and the South lost, the North started taking a bunch of stuff back. And, well, one of the things that we started taking was this pine tree that grows up very tall, very straight, and very wide around. So. A lot of that wood was shipped back up here and has built most of the buildings in Holyoke, but all over the place. A lot of people don't fully understand that part of being an artist is taking your process at the, with the same seriousness as like a scientist, you know. You have to remember different chemical mixes in order to have certain results. And if you don't, write that down and then definitely come back to stuff and be like, oh man, how did I get that color? <laughs> Just starting to come together a lot more now. The propane tank mass that I create since college, I've probably done about 700 of them. So the mask really became an identity-based exploration where looking at the past and seeing that, number one, the mask is in every culture. And if it's not in a culture, there was some form of face painting or scarification. But to live as humans and see all these faces and the only one you don't see is your own, what that generates is a means of personifying yourself through an object <clears throat> or some type of coloring or, you know, like I said, scarification that expresses how you feel on the inside since you can't necessarily project what you see on your outside. It was, to me, very awesome to see how many different cultures use a mask for a death mask, for a life mask, to, you know, immortalize somebody, to pay homage to somebody. To know that 99% of that 700 is out and around the world somewhere in someone's house, on their wall, who knows, maybe gone, but I sold it at a show and, you know, they're out and around and I'll never be able to find them again. Yeah, my name's on it, but my, my expression, my, my heart, you know, my soul is put into that piece. You get this, I wouldn't call it godly, that's a little far-fetched, but you get this feeling of being a creator and leaving things behind that people will cherish. 
as a metal worker, as a sculptor, as a mentor, as anything else. You know, I keep this picture of myself up when I was 17 because it's to remind me that at one point somebody looked at that dude and said, ah, he's a loser. He's not going to make it. He's not going to become anything. And so it reminds me to say to these young guys, I'd never do that to you, you know, and I'll always put forth the best foot I can, whether you want to be here or not. Hello, my name is Sue Katz, and welcome to Gallery A3 on this virtual art walk. Take a look at our new exhibit, Encounters. Until we can resume our regular exhibition schedule, we're moving to this new mode to display work from walls to windows. And here's Val. Hi, it's, my name is Val Gilman. All of us here are members of Gallery A3, which is a co-op gallery in Amherst. And this is a very exciting moment where we not only are show you, showing you things here virtually, but we also finally 
have a place to show in the window of our gallery space. So we're hoping that you'll come by. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of um, behind the scenes. It's kind of fun to hear what happens. So what happened is I, I have, I do craft shows also, and I brought my booth um, panels <laughs> lined up on top of my car. It's really hilarious to see my car driving down with all these booth panels on them. Brought them in, and um, Sue and I spent some time arranging them in front of the window so they look good and seem stable. And uh, GK Kalsa, also a member of the gallery, is going to clean them up, paint them up, and then Keith is going to, um, Keith Hollingsworth is going to hang the show. And I got to tell you, there are more pieces in the show in the window than you're going to see, than you're seeing right now in this virtual thing. So again, please do come by and see what we have. Uh, and this is Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Holland. And now that Val has brought you behind the scenes with the panel, I want to kind of bring you around in front of the scenes and talk about what we will see in looking at Encounters. So Encounters, the name of the show, what we were thinking was really about finding, well, making connections and finding ways to connect in different ways. So some of the works are really looking for personal moments and especially looking for the intimacy that a lot of us found we were missing in these weeks and months of the um, pandemic-induced isolation. But other works are really looking more towards confrontation and were inspired by the protests uh, against police brutality and the cries for racial justice that were initially sparked um, by the murder of George Floyd. But of course, not all the encounters are literal. Some of them are metaphorical, mystical, magical, even abstract. Um, you can think of color and maybe blue bumping up against warm earth tones. Or a circle can uh, confront a square and that can be another kind of encounter. Uh, and in the realm of our imagination, a perhaps a sentient fish may encounter a young woman underwater in the Deerfield River. So then all of these different kinds of interpretations, all of these different takes, then come together and encounter each other on the front of the panels that Val and others have been working to prepare and set up. And now back to Sue. Gallery A3 is a contemporary artist-run gallery in downtown Amherst. We are supported in part by a grant from the Amherst Cultural Council, a local agency, supported by the Mass Cultural Council, a state agency. For July's virtual art walk, we thank Amy Crawley and Amherst Arts Night Plus and Amherst Media. Also, thanks to G.K. Kalsa for his work with Valerie Gilman for setting up the panels for the windows. Special thanks to Marianne Connolly for her inspiration and expertise in working with Zoom. And also thanks to you for watching this small preview of our exhibit encounters. And the complete exhibit opens July 2nd to August 1st with more works by more artists displayed in front of the windows of Gallery A3. So we hope you take a stroll downtown and look and see. Thank you.
wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are parting. Hide me, where troubles melt like lemon drops away upon the chimney top. That's where, that's where you're gonna find me. You better believe it now. Somewhere over the rainbow, where it's gonna fly home. Birds fly over the rainbow.
one of the things that strikes me the most about Du Bois was he was proud of being African American. He wanted to be African American and American. The word Negro, uh, he fought to have it capitalized in, in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And for me, that is such a powerful statement, the idea to, to have this word capitalized. He really understood, I guess, the power of, of art to, to make people understand race, and in particular, like, um, human relations. He died on the eve of the March to Washington. He died on the eve of the Civil Rights Movement. And I think that Du Bois was potentially such a powerful figure and the government was terrified of him for that reason. I look at Du Bois as more like a deity. His practice as it being important to me. There's several different people who I kind of put in that little pantheon of individuals or things that move me. It's from musicians to grandparents to best friends and people who have come and gone. And I try to carry whatever I may have gotten from their presence. It's almost, that's like the fuel for the work for me. How do you honor this person in a way? My work has always been about honor, um, pride, celebrating who I am. And um, then the one with the double consciousness piece that I was playing with was really playing with this ideal, this mirrored image and um, in, in many ways, it's kind of like a self-portrait as, um, as an African-American artist operating in different worlds. Making work, is, it's, it's difficult to talk about the process because it's a lot of things. My studio becomes more like my church, so I have questions, I go to my I go to my studio and I ask questions. The past, but then also the present. What would Du Bois say if he came to Braddock and saw the reality of what we were facing? In the 1980s, all the steel mills had collapsed, and so what was left was a very small population, predominantly African-American families, but not much of an infrastructure or any type of uh, economic stability. At that time, Braddock was pretty much abandoned by the local, state, and government uh, support. So as a child, I didn't realize the magnitude of how heavily we were impacted by disinvestment, but I knew that uh, I was born into poverty and that it was a hard life. Braddock, Pennsylvania is located nine miles outside of Pittsburgh along the Monongahela River. My family migrated there in the early 1900s to work in Andrew Carnegie's steel mill. I was able to start building the body of work that I have been doing for over 11 years now on Braddock. And I saw, you know, a speech by Du Bois at his high school in 1930 about the condition of the Housatonic River. I just started smiling because I knew like this was it. This is what would help me figure out the series that I needed to produce. And he goes on to say, the town, the whole valley has turned its back upon the river. They have sought to get away from it. They have neglected it. They have used it as a sewer, a drain, a place for throwing their waste and their awful. And so I wanted to parallel my personal and autobiographical experience of living along the river with the way Du Bois felt about what had happened to the Housatonic River from since he was a boy and then became an adult. And I was thinking, you know, 
for 10 years I've been on foot photographing Braddock. I'm gonna get up in the air. And I go up into the air to get this aerial view of Braddock. Here we are looking at it in real time, real color, like the flesh, the tissue, and the makeup of this town along this river. I was born by a golden river and in the shadow of two great hills five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And the house was quaint with clapboards running up and down, neatly trimmed, and there were five rooms, a tiny porch. And we wanted to be a master class to study the life and the legacy of uh, Du Bois. We, did, we read the Credo. They wrote their own credos, they illustrated their own credos, just to get the sense of entering the, 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 the inspiration of Du Bois. I was inspired to write about what I believed in. And here's our very dark water. It's going to take a long time to dry. Slow. What was very important was their own interpretation that's uniquely theirs of the credo from Dark Water. When it came to Du Bois, I was really thinking about some of his essays. It's just about women and African-American women in particular and sort of our place and sort of the importance of African-American women. The, the course of my trajectory and sort of my studio practice begins from my experimentation and exploration with using uh, craft materials and taking those craft materials and trying to integrate a low art into sort of a high art dialogue. The perception of hair that has its own sort of like long history um, for African Americans of sort of the acceptance of your really fine coarse curly hair to your straight Hair, how that sort of defines how people perceive you. And so for me, I wanted to sort of bring some of that to the forefront as the idea of portraiture. My name is Julie Maratu. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1970. I uh, lived here until 1995 when I went to graduate school at the Royal Island School of Design. And since 2007, I've been living part-time in Berlin. That there's this groundwork or foundation that was laid out by someone like Du Bois, who understanding of self and perspective and possibility. And so this comes, I, I think, that in, in trying to negotiate all of these realities, there's a certain place of locating or finding possibility or different possibility for who you can be and how you can be. So these etchings are made trying to invent, make sense, or excavate my own mark making and language. Art has to be more about kind of wrestling with, with truths. What did Du Bois say? And what I want to know about is, is the truth. I want to know about how this work is, is, is going to further and, and, and progress, you know, people's understanding of, of race and race relations. I'm interested in the Star of Ethiopia for a lot of different reasons. For me, uh, what really 
was most interesting is, is the idea of, of Du Bois, the scholar, as, as being like a creative, you know, force. Being able to produce and to write, a, you know, a pageant in 1913 that was about the 10,000 year history of, of the black race, you know, and, and to be able to have enough resources to have costumes made, to have dancers, to have a director of uh, dramatics. It's a narrative in, in, in a form that I'm not used to dealing with. It's, it's a pageant, which means it's about like postures, it's about gestures, it's about music, it's about going on stage and not necessarily saying it, but being that character and then walking off stage and allowing this processional of, of costumes and music and, and people. As a 21st century artist, it's like, well, what is a pageant? You know, and then I start thinking about music videos. These small moments, these characterizations. Du Bois has uh, one of the protagonists, uh, you know, as, as the veiled woman. And then so, I, I, you know, what I'm working on uh, today is, is, is exploring this idea of, like, uh, Negro womanhood through um, the veiled woman. In a time period where it was extremely hard for, for African Americans to live, he was, you know, collecting, you know, $10,000, you know, from people to be able to, to mount this play and, and, and showcasing it in, in ballparks um, in major cities. One of the, the greatest attributes of, of Du Bois is that he really, began, you know, could understand what it was like to be a black in America, but also Hey, you know, he, he took that dangerous step to, 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 to be curious, to say, well, what, is, what are white people, you know, thinking about me interpreting blackness? I prepared the work in my studio for a few weeks in London, packed everything together and sent it, shipped it here. The work was installed by Heidi Johnson, a professional paper hanger. And I kind of freaked out a little bit because I've never done this before. I've never, ever had somebody else install my work. I was kind of trying to plan the piece, that every single thing that I sent Heidi had to be where I said it was going to be. Oh, I found it so difficult, but it worked out. I, I sent her a visual map. This piece is, um, is called Held, February the 23rd. The initial inspiration came from a trip to Ghana in 2005. And the transatlantic slave trade has long been an interest of mine. And I've long wanted to actual, actually travel to the sites. On my return from that trip, this piece of work, Hold, came about. And basically it is a hold, it's um, a holding space for um, um, Africans before they were transported. And in, in this exhibition, Held, I wanted to make something life-size so that, that my audience, the viewer, can, is, is literally held and pulled in. I consider the figures in my piece of work in Held, 23rd of February, in some ways as the souls of black folk. They are, they're ciphers, they're, they're kind of ghosts of African peoples. Du Bois was indicted for not having registered as an agent of a foreign power. He received the indictment on his 83rd birthday. And Du Bois's position, along with the other members of the Peace Information Center, was that they were not agents of a foreign power. There are five files. They're predominantly centered between his 83rd year and his 94th year. The files are redacted, which means, you know, blacked out. So my coming to terms was to remove, remove them, to point them out by cutting them out. And I built an audio narrative 
which in my mind really has to do with the influence of Du Bois. And then there is a third component, a tabloid. The idea is for it to be distributed across campus. It does form a narrative. And so very publicly indicted, very quietly found innocent. In a lot of people's minds, forever guilty. And ultimately, you know, he moved to Ghana when he was 90, 93, 94, and died within a year. It occurred to me that I could name a flower for Du Bois and that I could have thousands of people participate with me in remembrance of, of Du Bois. And in thinking, about, in thinking about this idea, I had actually a peony name for Du Bois and uh, that's been registered with the American Peony Society. It's called the, um, uh, the W.E.B. Du Bois Peony, but its common name will be the Hope Peony. It's sort of an amazing moment in time, historically. You know, you've produced this work and it's about race. Well, it's partly about race, but considerably more. And that's the thing that really interests me, that considerably more. How do we begin to approach blackness and understand blackness as something that is much more complex and complicated than merely black? I'm always thinking about, you know, how to activate the space, how to activate the wall, so that the, the, the movement isn't completely linear and flat, that you, have to, that you have to look up and that you have to look down. And I've sort of done some exploration around the peony and its development, and I have photographs of the site and photographs of complementary florals that will go along with this peony uh, in order to anchor our garden. So my, my garden for the boys it's a garden so that people will remember the legacy of an extraordinary man. And I realized at a certain point while looking at another memorial site that I couldn't think of a really great contemplative space for an African American. And then the question also, you know, Du Bois in our time. So how does that then manifest within, you know, specifically for me right now currently? So the ideas of civil rights and movements that he was fighting for. I grew up in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, and in 1989, my family emigrated to Canada. We are of many generations in Kenya, uh, of a Goan background, Goan Indian background. So kind of this sort of hybrid identity. I've created then a symbolic version of the Encyclopedia for the Negro, and that is a handmade book with black paper. So there's no actual like typing or script or writing in the book. I'm having the University Color Guard march from the Du Bois Library, marching with this book in a procession, giving it its sort of like acknowledgement. How does the performer's body uh, produce a gesture of political movement? In my practice, I've looked at the power of language, the idea of how does one forget a language growing up in Kenya. I uh, spoke Swahili. Moving to Canada, that language became lost to me uh, because I wasn't using it. So I'm kind of curious about the process of becoming, the process of being. 
there's ideas of like what would this book be? Du Bois struggled to make it, but it never it could never it could never exist. So I've placed my encyclopedia in the space as an intervention because it's kind of like a question of like, well, that wasn't made, but then it is here and it's sitting in this place of of historic account, which then makes it kind of become an artifact and then kind of like also further you know heightens it to become something different. You know, it's it's. Is it artwork or is it, uh, is it an artifact? And it plays within that liminal space. So within my piece, I have created um, a sort of a wall mural using the sort of colors of, um, of the Kenyan flag, which for me symbolizes a home, but symbolizes um, Kenya, which is very specific to me, but also kind of this sort of idea of Africa. And, um, and, so, and that was a place that you know, Du Bois also kind of mentions and reflects on throughout his work, throughout his work uh, the idea of, you know, again, about, again about a pan-Africanism. And so I've created a series of banners that are talking about an end. And in the end, we find a new beginning.